All right, now let me just pin myself and then we can get rolling here, cool. So my name is Gina Paulus. I am a gymnast lifelong. I also am a women's health specialist and a personal trainer. This presentation is entitled, What Gymnasts with Diastasis Recti Need to Know. And the reason I wanted to do this was I know that a lot of gymnasts, especially adult gymnasts, have diastasis recti, and they're not really sure how to navigate it and what to do. So I wanted to present something to help people understand more about it and to give you kind of a jumping off point. So I mentioned before, and I'll say it again, I am a pregnancy and postpartum exercise specialist, but that doesn't mean that I only help women who have had kids. I actually myself have not had kids, but I have suffered from abdominal injury and not to get into comparisons or anything, because I don't really think that that makes a lot of sense. But I did have a number of surgeons tell me that what my surgeries were basically made a C-section kind of look like a joke. And the reason they said that was I had wounds from two different abdominal surgeries that took seven weeks to even heal. And that's kind of like to get me to my place of normally when they stitch you back up, you're going to be able to start your healing process. And I actually had to wait seven weeks to even start that healing process because my incisions both got infected. And again, I'm not trying to do comparisons and everybody's different, but I just want you to understand that I've been through major abdominal surgeries and I've been able to overcome some of the issues that I developed through those. And so because of that, plus with my training of the postpartum and pregnancy specialist, I have a pretty good grasp on what it takes to, to really thrive after having experiences like this with our body. And I have been an adult gymnast who's competed for, gosh, between childhood and adult, it must've been 20 plus years altogether. I kind of stopped counting at a certain point. Um, so I've got a ton of that experience. So just to rewind just a little bit to dive into my story a bit more, because I think stories really help us know where we're starting and where we're headed. I did have two abdominal uh, intestinal obstructions when I was in my 20s. Both of them, like I said, got infected. Both of them were considered major surgeries. I was actually told by a number of doctors that the only way I could recover from these surgeries or not really recover, but to get back to the functioning that I would, I once had been, would be to get um, a total abdominal wall reconstruction with mesh. Now this procedure would have been a seven week, I'm sorry, not seven week, seven day hospital stay. And it would have been many, many months of healing. They even told me that I had to wait two years to get the procedure for my body to heal from those surgeries so that I could then be even eligible to get the surgery. Meanwhile, I'm an adult gymnast. I'm really competitive with that. I've got a busy life. I've got a business. I didn't want to wait around and do that, but at the same time, I didn't really have any other options. So what I ended up doing was I just rehabbed my abs as best as I could. Nobody directed me. Nobody guided me. I didn't even know that it was an option to be guided in that way. I was able to actually get my core so strong that when I went, when I went for my follow-up, Two years later, the doctor said to me, hey, do you feel strong? And I said, yeah, I do. And they said, do you have pain? And I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, you don't really need the surgery if you're feeling really good. So that was way back in 2010. And I continued competing in gymnastics. I did wear a brace for a little while. Um, there was a point actually right after I had stopped doing gymnastics, ironically enough, in 2018, that I was doing a sit-up one day and I felt a ripping sensation across my abs. And that of course scared me. I didn't know what it was. I ended up going to the doctor and they told me that I had two hernias in my incision site. So that was really the start of my journey just in like the whole, let's figure out how to heal this realm. And I once again was told I would need this total abdominal wall reconstruction, but the doctors cautioned me. They said, you're getting older. We don't really know if this surgery will even take away your pain. We don't know if the surgery will take, you might need multiple surgeries maybe like every five to 10 years. And I just didn't feel like it was the right answer. It didn't feel confident enough to me to really go in that direction. So I started researching. I was able to find some information of how to help my core. And it not only helped my hernias get better, which I actually have proof of on imaging that this happened, six months between starting my exercises and the six months later, I went from having the two hernias that were considered large to no hernias at all and no diastasis. So that was a pretty cool thing. And I felt so excited about it. I just wanted to make sure I became educated enough that I could teach other women and men because men have diastasis as well. I wanted to teach them these techniques. And I also realized that it can actually really help our gymnastics because the, obviously the stronger our core is, the better we can do with that. So that's a history on me. That's how I got to where I am now. 
I will request to anyone on the call that you keep yourself muted unless there's a question. Please hold questions till the end. I will stay on as long as needed, um, but I do feel that a lot of the questions might be answered as I go along. And I also wanna make this efficient for people who wanna watch the replay, but I'm more than happy to answer questions at the end or via email and I'll be giving my email out as well. Um, so you'll have access to that. So um, this will be a little bit of a blend of education as well as active things where we'll be testing certain things in our body. You of course may or may not participate in that, but if you want to, there's a couple of things you'll wanna have. One thing is a hand towel. Something just like this is perfect. A t-shirt can do in a pinch. Two pens is great. We'll be measuring our rib cage angle with those. And then just a space on the floor. We'll be popping on the floor and trying some stuff. If you're in a position that that works for you tonight, that should be fun. Um, otherwise you can watch and I'll be showing you what all that will be. So what is diastasis recti is a great question. And a lot of people throw the term around, but I'm not even entirely sure that they all know what they're even saying with that. Um, so many gymnasts do have diastasis recti, which is otherwise known as a DR, and that is a thinning of our lineal alba. So I'm going to show you on me and I will let you know I still have some scarring from my procedures, but no worries, everything's all healed. So here is our linea alba, it's in the middle, and it's a thinning of that tissue. So that's really what we're talking about with that. So everybody has a diastasis, but it's a matter of how big is it and is it considered normal or not? So when we say DR, we're really referring to that dysfunctional level of a widening of that area there. And so we do have connective tissue that connects all of our ab muscles at the midline. So that's really what this is talking about. It's talking about that in the middle of our stomach. So there's other things besides pregnancies that can cause this. I've obviously already alluded to my situation of surgery, but sports can also cause it. We're probably all seeing pictures of bodybuilders who have that bigger space between their great six pack muscles that you can see. That is another case possibly of diastasis would have to measure them to see, but a lot of bodybuilders do have it. I've actually noticed that just in looking at them because they're so lean, you can see it. So this tissue is capable of healing, which is pretty cool. A lot of people think, oh, once it's there, it's just there and I need surgery. That's the only way to fix it. Maybe, maybe not. Most of the women that I've met, and I have worked with some men as well, most of the people that I've met with this condition, I've been able to help them get it from abnormal to normal. I'm not going to say for everybody, that's, I don't think that's a fair statement, but I have seen it work for so many. And so definitely realize that the tissue can heal and that that is pretty common if you know the right stuff. And um, you can choose to leave, leave a DR alone. A lot of people will leave it there and just go about their life. And sometimes nothing bad happens to them. And that's great. We don't always fix everything that we know about or even not know about in our body. And sometimes everything's okay. There are a few reasons you wanna think about fixing it though. One reason is it's gonna cause a little bit more weakness in your core. The other reason is we can form hernias like happened with me. Um, I don't really know if I had a DR before my hernia, but I know that the whole situation didn't help matters and getting the hernia was probably inevitable given what I went through and the fact that I didn't know what I know now. <clears throat> so we are going to go ahead and try assessing diastasis next. So I'm going to show you how it works and that is how we'll go with that. Um, so it is pretty easy to assess it on your own. I find that when people assess on their own and then they go to the practitioner, most of the time the practitioner is going to agree with your self-assessment. So don't be afraid and you can poke around and feel. And if you're not sure, you're not sure and that's fine too, but it's pretty easy. So I invite you all to join me and see how you're feeling in your apps. So what we're going to do is lie on our back on a spot on the floor and you don't need any props for this at all. All right, so you're gonna go ahead and lie on your back with our knees bent. Okay, so nice and comfortable here. Now what I'm going to have you do is lift your head a little bit off the floor, and then you're gonna take one hand and you're going to feel for the ridge of rectus muscles, which are the what we think of as the six pack muscles. You're gonna feel around for those, okay? Now once you've felt, you're gonna see if you can tell how many fingers. So this would be one finger width, two, three, and we're doing it up and down. So we're seeing how wide that space is between those ridges of ab muscles. And we're gonna start by checking it right around the belly button. So when I feel for mine, I'm feeling maybe one and a half fingers. 
take a little break. So we can have DR above at or below our belly button. And depending upon where you might have it, or maybe all the spots, it will depend upon what type of exercises are best for you. So you'll want to remember what you find. What we're going to do next is right above the belly button. An inch and a half above is a good spot. So again, you're lifting your head. You're feeling for the rigid muscle. For me, I'm feeling more like a two finger width up here. And you press firmly. You might need to press a little bit more firmly than you think to feel the muscles. Now we're going to go below the belly button and try the same thing. For me, I'm getting a little bit less, so about a one, maybe one and a half fingers there, which makes sense because my surgery was primarily above my belly button. So again, it's no stress just poking around and seeing what you can feel there, and that will give you a sense of whether or not you even need to work on your DR. Because like I said, the two fingers width or less is considered normal. The other thing that you can play around with while you're down there is how responsive is it? So gymnastics, right? We all know about trampolines. You want that tissue to feel somewhat like a trampoline. It should have a little bit of rebound to it. So that's another thing that you can test for. And we're really going for that rebound rather than it almost feeling like it's going into a canyon or a depth that just doesn't have that responsiveness. So we can both work on our width of our um, DR or the depth or both, depending upon what is going on. So all that's a little bit beyond this call. This is more of an exploration call, but that's just to give you information. That way we want to both get the width proper as well as the uh, consistency of it. So it is important to know that 60% of women who have had a pregnancy and have delivered baby are going to have a DR at the six week mark. Okay. Everybody has one the day of delivery. So then by the six week mark, 40% of people have healed and 60% have not. And then going all the way up to 12 months, we have 32% still have a DR. So what does that tell us? It tells us a couple of things. One, it tells us that giving a blanket statement of wait the six weeks, and then you can go back to exercise. I mean, fine, but what exercise are we talking? Are we talking like V up, some leg lifts and gymnastics, or are we talking go for a walk? That's really the thing. And a lot of times these surgeons and doctors are not giving us very specific advice. And that's one of the things I really wished I had when I was recovering from surgery is I really wanted a physical therapist who could guide me more closely or a trainer that knew more about this. But in my case, nobody was given to me and I didn't know that the specialty existed and I just kind of modeled my way through. So part of my goal is to make this information more accessible to people. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this call tonight. So we don't really know what camp we're in until we do the assessment, figure out if we have a DR. So definitely don't compare yourself if you have a friend or somebody that you know that just bounced right back right away. Well, they might've been somebody who didn't have the DR you know, at that six week mark. So just try to be kind to yourself with comparisons in that way. And the other thing you need to know is that a DR really means that your system can't handle pressure well. So if we think about our core, kind of like a canister, Okay, so it's, it's a circular canister here, and if we're spilling things off the front, then that is what a DR is because that's a weak spot in your core. So it doesn't have to be crazy scary about thinking like, oh, I have this thing wrong with me. It's more about how do you manage the pressure, and this is something that we can learn how to do better. So if you do generate pressure in a poor manner and you do have a DR, you are going to see a few things. You might see your midline bulge out when you're doing exercise. You might even see it bulge out when you're just standing around. And it can be anything from a little bit of like a ball shape. It can be, look more like a ridge. It can poke through your shirt, but it's usually pretty obvious. And a lot of women do feel self-conscious about it. So you want to be looking for that. That's a sign that things aren't being managed well in there. And if you see a bump, for sure, you want to see a doctor because that could be a hernia. So that's important because hernias are inherently a little bit more risky than DR. Hernias can in rare instances, but they can become unstrangulated. And it's definitely important to have a doctor's go ahead that you can work out and that you can even try exercises like this. And that you're not in an emergency if you're in that type of situation. 
So the cool news about it is we can do anything if we can learn to manage the pressure well. And part of that's just awareness. And part of it is literally doing the exercises and remodeling our fascia. So fascia takes a little bit longer to remodel than muscle does, but it tends to be really long lasting. So it's definitely work that's worth doing. One thing that a lot of women do when they have a DR or they might not know they have it, but they sense that something's weak there or something's protruding out is they will do this thing where they will pull in their belly button kind of in an attempt to hold everything in. Holding things in is not a great idea for a couple of reasons. Number one, it actually does nothing when you pull in your belly button, it does nothing to close the space between the apps. And that's really what the name of the game is with this. We wanna be closing the space between. So it might make you feel like you're creating more stability, but it really doesn't help in that way. Um, The other problem with it is we have these muscles called TAs that wrap around our core. And so they start here, they wrap around. We have middles, we have uppers, and we have lowers. When you're constantly drawing in your TAs, you are actually creating excessive pressure there. And what can happen with that is it can put more pressure down on your pelvic floor. And it also can prevent you from getting the best oxygen into your system. Obviously, we want as much oxygen as we can get when the lungs can't excursion as deeply down because you're holding in here, you're gonna get less oxygen. So it's really not the best strategy. It's a habit that a lot of people develop and it's one that you definitely wanna try to break. So then the question becomes, well, if I can't hold my belly button in Gina, what should I do? Corrective exercises for the rescue. So corrective exercises, they can be thought of as rehab or PT type thing. I mean, I'm not a PT, so probably don't call it PT, but um, they're basically designed to help our body rework how it's functioning. And they definitely fall into the exercise category because as we all know, PT generally is a blend of hands-on stuff as well as exercise. I'm not gonna be doing a lot with hands-on stuff today, although there are things you can do for yourself. Today is more of like an overview type call. And I will be able to talk more about that. I also have a plan in place for next call for us to all do a circuit workout together, which should be super fun. One of the reasons I wanted to hold on that is because some of the people in this that listen to this call might find that they're not actually good candidates for DR work yet because they've got pelvic floor issues. So I just didn't feel good about having a bunch of people try things that maybe wouldn't be the healthiest for them. So we're going to wait on that. But what we are going to do right now is we're going to try a very gentle exercise where you can actually determine how well you are doing with side and back breathing, which is another great way to help take pressure off our DR. So if we have a lot of pressure going up the front, one of the reasons could be how well are our side ribs moving and how well are our back ribs moving? And we're gonna test that right now. So this is the time where the hand towel will come in handy, okay? So I'm gonna have everyone that has that roll it up. We're gonna form a burrito with the towel. So now we've got that nice roll, okay? And then we'll lie on our back. No, not your back, I'm sorry. On our side, yes. All right, so on your side. And the towel is going to go under where the natural curve of your waist goes. This is designed to help you keep your spine neutral without having to do very much work. Down the line, I sometimes have people get rid of the towel, but for today, we're definitely gonna go ahead and use it. So then you're going to place your hand on your side. You want index finger on the side ribs, thumb way in the back, okay? Now I'm gonna have you all take one breath and think about, did your index finger move? Go ahead and take another one. If it didn't move, see if you can get it to move by intention. And take one more. All right, so now we're going to try the back ribs. That's where your thumb is. Okay, so take the breath. Nice and big breath. Let's take another one. Normally, it's harder for people to get the back ribs to move than it is to get the sides. I'm going to have you flip over onto your other side and see how that side does. There may or may not be a difference from one side to the next. Most commonly, the right side is a little bit trickier for people to get to move, but it it can be really individual. So 
it's always good to assess our own body and feel what we feel and make note of that. And so what this exercise is designed to do is it's, uh, it's giving us awareness of, are we breathing in a 360 fashion? So when we take a breath, ideally our lungs and our rib cage are going to expand not only this way, but this way and this way. So it's 360, our lungs are shaped circular and they expand and contract. And our rib cage is the same way. But over the years, for various reasons, a lot of us have really gotten to the pattern of only the front ribs moving. And that can come from so many things. One of the most common is back injuries, which I know a lot of gymnasts have experienced. When you have pain, you don't want to breathe into your side of your back because it hurts. And then our body gets used to not utilizing the lungs fully. When we're pregnant, our posture shifts in a manner in which we're getting way more movement in the front than in the back. And now the back is having to hold up this extra weight and, and shape differences, right? With the belly, you know, going forward and the back is here and it's throwing everything off. And just because we've had a baby, it does not mean that our body will just snap back. It does happen for some people, it doesn't happen for most of us. So that exercise will tell you a lot of information about how well your rib cage is moving. And you can make it a goal of getting the back to move just as much as the side and just as much as of the front as well. And so when we can get our ribs to move really well, it's going to help our ribs move better, our back feel better, our neck feel a lot better too, as well as our DR to heal. So I mentioned neck, you say, well, why would that be? So a lot of times when people have that preference to just breathe in the front, what's gonna happen is they're not gonna get enough air. So then they're going to breathe in and their shoulders are gonna go like this. I'm kind of exaggerating it to show you guys, but even just a little bit up and down, this part should lift a bit, but we really don't wanna see a lot of this. That's a sign that we're over using our accessory muscles, which are accessory breathing muscles are gonna be the top and then your neck versus the ones really designed, which is your diaphragm, which is inside, as well as the muscles between the ribs. So that just gives you that explanation of why working on that 360 is really helpful. And so also we can think about our rib cage angle. So I mentioned that there sometimes can be differences left to right of how well our lungs expand. And again, it can be a whole mess because it can be, well, you know, normally this side's better, but then I got injured over there and then this side got, and it just gets all jumbled up. So really trying to figure out why it might just be kind of frustrating and it really doesn't matter because what we want to do is just make it all better. So I'm going to show you how to check your rib cage angle. And I find that the pens or pencils are really handy. Some people will draw on their self with magic marker. I don't, it's too messy for me. I'm not really into that, but whatever floats your boat. Um, so we're going to go and look at the belly here. And what we're going to do is take the pens and you might have to suck in a bit to really feel, but you want to line that up with your rib, uh, the bottom ones, and then you want to form it a point at the top. Okay, and I know it's a little crazy because the ribs are not totally straight, but you're basically just trying to do your best that you can with this and seeing what angle you have. All right, so mine eh, might be a smidge bigger than 90, but it's pretty close. When I first started doing the corrective exercise stuff, I was out to here. Like, it was crazy. My ribs were so wide. And actually, I was able to go down a whole bra band size just from doing these exercises. And it's funny because I went back to the size that I was before my surgeries and all that crazy stuff. So it's the way my body wanted to be, but it got off with all the surgeries. So it just shows you how really like real life this can be. Like you can actually make yourself smaller without losing weight or anything like that. It's all just the ribs. So you can make note of this. Now, anything that's 110 or less is considered normal, but I would say for the best function, we really wanna be pretty close to 90. Most gymnasts that I've seen are either 90 or they're wider. I would say wide is probably the most common. And then there will be some people in life that will be smaller, but I, I don't see that that often with gymnasts. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that is less common. And most of the DR exercises are gonna be catered towards bringing you from wide to more narrow. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If your ribs are wide, you're probably gonna have a wider linea alba as well. So, um, the wide ribs, when they are like that, that's going to make your abs less effective because if you think about it, your muscles are being pulled apart and it's more work for them to get closer together. So that just makes sense, right? 
So the other thing I wanted to talk about is we have muscles called TAs that I alluded to earlier. The TAs, like I said before, wrap around, okay, like that. They actually never touch in the middle at all. So they're a really cool muscle group because you don't have any loss of function from them. Well, technically from getting cut open with a surgery or from being pregnant, um, they definitely will tend to be weaker, but it's not because they were hurt in that way. So it's kind of cool because they have a lot more potential. Like even as bad as my surgeries were, my TAs weren't cut, which is pretty cool. So I was more able to work on those. And our TAs are really what a uh, transverse abdominis is what that stands for. They hold our muscles like a natural corset and kind of keep everything in for us. So we don't have to worry about sucking in or any of that because those muscles just hold everything in nice and even. So those are awesome muscles to work. And we'll definitely be covering those in my circuit workout call that I plan to do. And so people that have a DR tend to actually have a weak inner core system too. So all these muscles I'm talking about, the rectus, which are the six pack, the TAs, those are all the superficial ones. We actually have deep core muscles as well. They run deep inside of us. And we have some in our neck, we have some in our pelvic floor, and then we have some around our diaphragm. So really any of those muscles could be contributing to your DR. And that's one of the big things I wanted to really bring to light in this call, because I see so many programs online where they say, oh, you know, this is your list of four exercises for your abs. We're going to fix your DR. That's fine. And it does sometimes work, but a lot of times people's problems run deeper than that. And I really would hate some, for somebody to try that type of plan and then only to find that their DR is still there and they don't, they feel like they've tried everything, but really the program was a lot more limited and I get it. Like people are trying to sell something to you, but I ethically, I don't like it because I feel like it's not complete and I don't like selling people stuff that isn't complete. So I like to tell you guys the truth about this stuff. Um, the other thing that's really important to know is that DR exercises can cause organ prolapse if your pelvic floor isn't strong enough to handle them. So we are going to be talking a bit about pelvic floor on this call, but to quickly talk about the symptoms that can alert you that there might be an issue. If you feel pressure or heaviness in your pelvic floor, if you experience unwanted leaking, if you have burning when you pee that isn't associated with a UTI, these are all possible symptoms of some dysfunction in your pelvic floor. If you know what a Kegel exercise is, which is basically drawing your pelvic floor up and you try to do that and you struggle to do it, it just feels really hard to you or you can't do it at all. That's another sign. And I will be doing some pelvic floor calls later on that should be helpful for people that have these types of things. It's crazy because there's so much to it and I want to fit everything in tonight, but it's just not going to work. So you'll have to wait on that one. Um, but the cool thing is learning really good breathing patterns, just like we did today with that sideline exercise. And I'll be doing another one with you guys in a minute. Just working on that alone can help the natural function of your pelvic floor as well as your core and help the function of your three diaphragms. So what I said before was we have neck, we have diaphragm here, and we have pelvic floor. So we actually have a diaphragm here under our lungs. We also have one deep in our neck, and we have one in our pelvic floor. And those three are really designed to work together as a team. So when any one of those don't work well, well, then we're going to have some issues. So going to the pelvic floor side for a minute here, we can have a pelvic floor that's either too loose or too tight. And I say too, just meaning compared to option, uh, the ideal, right? And athletes, most of the time, especially younger athletes that haven't had kids or even really women who have had kids too, but I would say for the younger athlete side of things that haven't had kids, they're going to almost always be too tight. Now, when you've had children, it could be a mixed bag, but again, I see more of it with the tight pelvic floor. And so that is generally what I find. Again, it's just a generalization. So one of the ways that we can uh, help our pelvic floor is to make sure our breath gets all the way down there because when the breath hits our pelvic floor, it is actually going to tell the pelvic floor to have that nice natural response of rising up. And I'll be able to demonstrate that right now. So we are gonna all do something together, which is a pelvic floor breathing test. And for this, you are going to wanna be seated because it's a better way of testing this. A chair is great. You can also sit on the floor cross-legged if that's comfortable for you. So we're all gonna sit down. And here in this position, we're going to think about our body as like a house. 
So my roof is the top of my head. The first floor is my neck. Second floor is chest. Third floor, diaphragm. Fourth, lower belly. Fifth, pelvic area. And then um, the, so the fifth floor is going to be the basement. And then out the basement window would be beneath our pelvic floor. So kind of like out the basement window is the analogy. All right, so to review, we've got roof, we've got first, second, third, fourth, basement, and then whoop, out the basement window. So now you can rest your hands gently on your legs to feel comfortable and relax here. And I'm gonna have you take a pretty big breath in. And I want you to notice where the breath stops on your body. How deep does it go? Go ahead. And there's no right or wrong answer, we're just observing. All right, so you probably have a theory of where it went. Now go ahead and do one more breath and see if it's the same. Okay, so I've worked on mine a fair amount. I will say that mine gets to my pelvic area. It doesn't go out the basement window, which is actually, we don't want that because out the basement window is too loose. If you're feeling your breath stop way up here, then we're probably airing on the side of a tighter pelvic floor. So take one more breath and see what you feel. And if you didn't get it very far down, see if you can encourage your body to maybe let that breath go a bit more. Sometimes just relaxing is helpful. Go ahead and try another breath. So the reason we do this test seated is because when we're standing, our pelvic floor naturally has to do more work and it can skew the results of the test. So if you were able to get it to maybe the fourth floor or the basement, that's great. You're, you're okay. You can proceed with DR type exercises. If not, then it shows you that you'll need to do a little bit more work with pelvic floor. So I do have some calls planned for that. If you can't wait and you just feel like you want more information, feel free to reach out to me. I, I provided my email. Like I said, I have discovery calls that you can set up because I obviously don't want anybody to be feeling like they need help and they can't get it but I've obviously got to do a little bit of um, strategizing as to how I'm releasing this information to everybody. So that was pelvic floor. And just to round out what I'm teaching you all about diastasis and what can cause it, we have other muscles that can actually contribute to a DR or even prevent it from healing, which are important to know about. One of them is called the serratus muscle. The serratus muscle is located right around here. And this is a muscle that we use when we reach for things, when we press, when we do bars, we're going to use it a lot. Handstands use it. So a lot of gymnastic stuff there. A lot of people though have worked around it where they've taught their body to use other muscles instead. So I find a lot of my DR clients need a little bit of serratus help. And there's specific exercises we can do to help that muscle make sure it gets and stays as strong as it can. We also have our mid and our lower traps. So everybody knows the upper traps, which are the ones that usually kind of get achy and sore. But then we have the middle and the lower ones. And those ones also play a really strong role in overhead work. So those are great muscles to make sure they're strong enough. So things like the ITYs, the uh, child's pose Y lifts, doing band work where you're doing this kind of thing uh, against a band, all that is great for those mid and lower traps. It's great for your posture and it really provides a good base of support for your abs to get even stronger helping with the DR. When those back muscles aren't strong enough, there's going to be more pressure out the front because your body's trying to manage that pressure and it doesn't have the muscle tissue it needs. And the glutes are another great example. When our glutes aren't as strong as they could be, it tends to let our pelvis go out of alignment. And so if we have pelvis here, okay, and then this is pretty normal alignment there. And then if we go this way, we're tipping into what we call an anterior tilt. And then this way is more of the posterior. So this is a situation in which the glutes are not working. They're gonna be right here. If they're not really working for us, we're gonna to tend to have problems keeping our pelvis in that neutral alignment. So a lot of gymnasts can use glute exercises it's not that hard to do gymnastics without the glutes because a lot of times our quads just take over. A lot of our skills, quad, 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 and it's really easy for our glutes to fall asleep. So I find a lot of gymnasts do need extra glute work. Traditional gymnastics conditioning doesn't always address this stuff. Like you always do your push-ups and your chin-ups and your leg lifts and all that's great. 
none of it does anything for these muscles I'm talking about. So I know it seems like extra work to do, but to be honest with you, my gymnastics got so much better when I spent time on some of these smaller muscles than when I just focused on the main things we think about with gymnastics conditioning. So really just having a plan of doing a few correctives on the side can really go a long way. One of the great things about gymnastics is it really does make us super, super strong. It already has a lot of built-in strength. We don't need a lot of extra to really get these muscles on board. Whereas if you have somebody that doesn't do any exercise, they just have such a long road to get fit that it can be a lot to them, but gymnasts are already so fit. It's really not a big deal. A lot of people I'll give them maybe 30 minutes twice a week and that's all they need. And it's amazing how much payoff that they'll get from that. So some people ask me, Hey, why couldn't I just brace my DR and take care of the problem that way? So I generally only recommend bracing immediately postpartum before you've even begun working out. And there's a few reasons for that. The main reason is that when you brace, it's actually going to cause a lot more pressure down because like I said before, the pressure has to go somewhere. So we have this tight brace around us and all of a sudden our pelvic floor is receiving a lot of extra pressure. That's how a lot of people develop prolapse long after they've had their baby. The other thing about a brace is it's basically doing the work that your muscles would normally have to do. So if you think about an ankle sprain, yeah, you might need to brace it at first, and yeah, you might need to brace it if you've got a big meat coming up and you just heard it a little while ago. But really, if you're going to something like physical therapy for your ankle, you're not going to wear your brace there. You're going to keep the brace off so that you can train those muscles and make that ankle strong. And so every time we're wearing the brace, we're losing out on benefit of making those muscles strong. So yes, you have to be a little bit more patient and you have to put in that work, but at the end of the day, you're gonna to have to do the work one way or the other. And so I just, to me, I'd rather the person build up their core, not need their brace for practice. Like obviously there's exceptions to it, but I can tell you like, I didn't know about corrective exercise and I went back to gymnastics and I raced and I really think it slowed my progress. And I also think it probably is why I ended up with hernias because I wasn't treating the root of the problem. So I would proceed with caution with brace. If you really truly feel that you need a brace, I would recommend that you get the kind that are actually bottom up support. So they look more like little shorts and that one I'm okay with because it does help protect the pelvic floor. So if you want to know names of those, please email me mastersgymnastics at gmail.com. And I can give you the brands that I've vetted and I think are pretty good. But so going back to the ankle analogy for a second, your fascia, which is that connective tissue that runs all across our body, it needs stressed heel. And so if we're never, ever stressing it, it's not going to get stronger. It's just like if you never swing on bars and your hands get, you know, you go to swing and then all of a sudden you're getting ribs. Well, they're going to grow back stronger once you've had that experience. So healing a DR can be a lot like that. You do little bits of stress. Ideally, you wouldn't get to the point where you fit. But you follow what I'm saying. You do a few swings one day, a few swings the next, and that's really the best. And then it never rips and everything's happy. Now, if you do it too far and you rip, okay, fine. You learned your lesson. Maybe that was a little bit too much, but it still will grow back stronger. So we really want to find that line of, hey, let's challenge ourselves, but ideally not like go so far that we get a little bit setback with it. But if that happens, it's actually better for most people than if they never get to that point. And I'll give you an example. If you never, ever, ever feel like you overdid your abs as you're working on your DR, you're probably leaving some results on the table because you weren't pushing the limit. You weren't seeing how far you could go. I've never met somebody who worked their abs so hard that they permanently made their DR worse. I've never seen this. What I have seen is people who babied it for years and years and never got better. So if it were me, and it has been me, I would err on the side of being okay with little bits of overdoing, but obviously trying not to, but if you have to go one side or the other, like make sure you're working hard because fascia does require stress to heal. So try not to be super fearful about this. Like I said, unless you have a hernia, it's very unlikely that you're going to do any crazy damage. And I've even had a lot of hernia clients who's, who have done great and everybody makes mistakes sometimes and overdoes it a little bit, but as long as you're doing way more appropriate days than too hard, things should be okay. So fear does not help us because it kind of stresses us out. And when we have stress, our bodies don't heal as well. So 
aside from bracing, you can do KT tape. And the reason it's different, KT tape is actually gonna help tell your muscles which ones we wanna come on board. And so I'm okay with that because it's not really doing the job of the muscles, rather it's actually helping your muscles to know how to work the best. So I do have a KT tape YouTube link that is up on the PDF that I'll be able to put on Facebook and I'll be able to send that out to anybody who sent, registered to get the recording. So I'll make sure that you guys all have that. If you wanna explore that, that can be a nice way to help the healing a, a little bit accelerate. So another question a lot of people have is, how do I know what is safe and unsafe for a DR? So I will be doing a future call to really dive into this because it's a big question, but in general, you want to avoid things if you have a DR that are along the line of really stressing in front of you. So your hollow holds, your leg lifts on a bar, your chin-ups, that stuff is putting a lot of pressure on the front. So the classic stuff that compresses your body, folds it up, that you're holding yourself as you're doing your chin-up. Anything like that is most likely to be a little bit more problematic. Now, you can do any ab move as long as you can manage pressure. And I've met people with DRs who can actually do chin-ups and they're fine with it. But what you'll see with them is they're able to do their chin-up and nothing is bulging out the front. So it really, really is super dependent upon the person. But in general, I would say no to stuff that's really, really heavy front-loaded and just waiting until you test your DR and it's that two fingers or less, then you, you're probably in a better position to be able to start working that stuff again, as long as you can do it without that pressure out. I do recommend using a mirror or a phone to film yourself or even a friend who knows how to look for this. And somebody can watch you and say, is, am I bulging forward or am I staying flat? And all that can be really helpful because like I said, it is very individual. Um, so we are going to do one more test today where we can actually work on something that is pretty convenient to do just in daily life. So you don't always need to lie down on the floor to try this. I love doing this one if I'm standing in line or if I'm sitting waiting for something, you can do it with nobody really knowing you're doing it. And this is a way of practicing 360 breathing just in sitting. You can do it in standing too. But for learning, I think sitting is really cool because you can relax and just focus on it. So for this, again, when you're starting out, you'll want to have index finger on your side, thumb way in the back, and then you're going to take your breath. You'll see my, my index finger is right on the seam of my shirt. It's pretty far back there. If you can't reach all the way back there, don't worry. Just do your best. It doesn't, it's not the end of the world if you can't reach all the way back. You can always solicit a friend or family member to help you as well if needed, but you're just breathing, okay? feeling that movement. If it's hard for you, you can practice first trying to make your index finger move like we did on the floor. And then you can try to make your thumb move. If you're feeling spunky, you can try to do both at once. And then once you get practice with it, you won't need your hand because you'll know what it feels like. And so I'll do this sometimes like at a red light at the, in the car, or like I said, in line and just kind of give myself those five breaths. And you'll be amazed how good your back will actually feel when you take the breaths like that. And the goal is eventually to make that your new normal. So when we're doing breathing exercises, yes, we're going to try to breathe really big. You don't want to do that all day long. Normal breath is going to be a lot smaller, but it can be really helpful to give yourself those five or even 10 breaths. I wouldn't do more than 10 at a time because you can hyperventilate, but 10 is a good stopping point. And like I said, during your day, you can do them pretty much all day long, but you just want to keep it a little bit smaller so that, because you want to match your breathing to your activity. So if you're running a marathon, you would breathe way bigger than if you're just like standing around, obviously. So just matching your breath to the activity is really good. And the other thing that's cool too, is good breathing practice can really help our stress hormones. Stress. I don't know anybody these days that doesn't have some type of stress in their life. So anything that we can do, obviously, to help that is going to be awesome. So it's great bang for your buck to do that. The other thing that we need to think about with our DR is our posture, right? So a lot of gymnasts have this kind of like, you know, here I am, like my butt's kind of sticking out, my belly is hanging forward. And it's just part of it is the way we stretch our body in gymnastics stretches some muscles a lot and it makes other muscles tighter, right? With the sport. And then the other thing is as we're getting tired, as we're doing our practice, like you just kind of get fatigued and you start standing less properly because you're tired and that makes sense. But 
if we stand like that, it's putting a lot of pressure out on our DR. So I do have a call plan to really dive into posture. And then the last thing that I wanted to bring up is shoulders. A lot of people don't know this, but dysfunctional shoulders and scapula can really cause a lot of problems with our DR and its healing. So examples would be forward shoulders, you know, this kind of thing, scapula that don't move. So if you're flexible enough, you can reach back and touch the tip of your shoulder blade. And then if you go and raise your arm up and down, ideally you'd want to feel that tip kind of spinning this way. Right. And if we can't feel that, and if our scapulars are kind of stuck, which a lot of gymnasts are, then it's going to put a lot more pressure on our DR because when we're trying to go up, say for a cast, right. And then we only make it to here because our scapula is stuck. We're going to have to arch our back to make it all the way up. And that's obviously a deduction as well as more pressure on our DR can contribute to back pain as well. So again, all this isn't to make you feel bad about yourself. It's just bringing awareness and saying, oh, wow, there's actually a lot of pieces to this. But the cool thing is if we work on each little piece, then sure enough, we can fix the DR and we can have even a happier, more functioning body for it as well. <clears throat> and I also have some plans to talk about more deeply posture and breathing during our skills, because it's one thing to get this all down with corrective exercise or doing daily life. It's a whole nother level to say, well, now we're going to do this in our gymnastic skills. And so it's pretty cool to take this and apply it to the skills. So I think that's going to be really fun. And then there is actually one more thing. Sorry, I lied. Um, pelvic positioning is another powerful aspect of our DR and whether or not we can heal it. So going back to our pelvis here for a sec. So our hamstrings, which are the back of our thigh, are going to, they're going to be back here. They are going to help us keep our pelvic oriented in a neutral position. Most gymnasts have hamstrings that are basically turned off. And what I mean by that is they're so stretched out that they don't really work very well to stabilize our pelvis. And then what ends up happening is the front of our pelvis, our hip flexors have to tighten to help. And then we develop a lot of issues by everything not really working the way it's designed to do. So obviously we have to have flexible hamstrings as gymnasts, that is part of it. But if we don't match that with strength, we then are gonna have a pelvis that's less likely to be good. So on a person, how it looks is, <clears throat> this is more of my neutral stance. This is what's called APT or anterior pelvic tilt. And this is what's called PPT or posterior pelvic tilt. And I'm trying to exaggerate so you can see, but usually in people, it's a little bit more subtle, more like this. And obviously when you're going about your day, you can move in and out of it. So what I'm talking about more is our resting posture. And most gymnasts are going to tend to be in that APT. So getting our hamstrings really strong is awesome to help, but there are specific exercises that I really like to make sure that we balance our hamstrings so that they actually work to reorient our pelvis rather than just blanket statement, stronger hamstrings, because that doesn't always fix the issue. So we're going to have some fun calls helping out with that too. And so I know this was a lot of information and I really thank you for hanging in there with me. It was important for me to give this great overview before we start doing the more specific calls on more specific aspects of this. I wanted you to understand the full picture that DR is multifaceted. And we can't always say it's as simple as learning a new way to do crunches or putting a brace on or waiting till however many months after we've had a baby. And also knowing that our bodies are self-healing. If you fall down and get a cut on your finger or your knee or whatever, it's going to heal as long as you give it that environment. If you dip it in chemicals and like, I don't know, scratch at it as it's healing, it's not going to heal. But if you take care of it and you put a bandaid on it and let it be, it's going to heal. And that shows us how our bodies really can do that. So don't lose faith in that. Your body is amazing. Okay. And think about too, all the women who healed and moved on, like nothing ever happened after birth. Like we all want to hate them a little bit, right? But it happens. And that's just a great motivation for us to say, oh, wow, our body does know what to do here. And some of us just need a little bit more TLC along the way to make it happen. The other thing that you can keep in mind is that second pregnancy, moving into third pregnancies, every time we add on a pregnancy, or even in my case, when I added on surgeries, the more surgeries or pregnancies we're going through, the harder it will be for us to generally get back 
And the reason is the, that's more time the tissue has been a little bit traumatized. That's more time that our tissues have been stretched and then gone back. And just like a balloon or a rubber TheraBand or something, the more times it gets stretched, it doesn't naturally bounce back as well. But it can, and the reason a TheraBand can't and our bodies can is we're living, breathing things. We can generate new cells after we've slept for a night. Like we can do amazing things and that piece of rubber is not gonna do it. So just by taking care of that body, getting good nutrition, getting good sleep, doing your exercises, you can really make a huge improvement. So some people will think, geez, you know, this all sounds cool, but I really would just rather get surgery. This is a lot of work. I don't really have time for all this stuff. So my comment to that would be, if you go ahead and get surgery without developing really healthy patterns, your odds of that surgery being successful are not super high. I hope for you, if you choose that, that you're fine. But like, honestly, I would be nervous because if you think about it mechanically, if you're putting pressure at the front, putting pressure at the front, your posture's not great, your muscles aren't in balance and you just get it fixed, that fix isn't as likely to hold as it would be if you reoriented your system in a healthier alignment. So the time that it takes to get surgery and heal is going to be measured in months, not weeks. And that's the same unit of time you're measuring correctives with. If you start a program this month, I would expect that by December, you would be better, which is six months from now, or at least well on your way. Same thing with surgery. So surgery isn't really a shortcut and it's certainly not a guarantee. Corrective exercises aren't a guarantee either, but you have so much less to lose. They're a lot less expensive. You don't miss work doing them. You, you know, don't go through a surgery that potentially couldn't, didn't go as well. I mean, for my surgery, I was told I might need mesh um, in there or actually I wouldn't need mesh. And I've heard horror stories about people getting infected with that. So like it might not have happened, but I don't know. And so to me, that unknown is kind of scary and I'm okay with getting the surgery if needed, but I would personally much rather do something that's safer and gentler. And that also kind of goes with the surgery, right? Because after surgery, you would still be doing PT like things in order to come back really healthfully. So to me, there's really no way getting out of the work of it. You have to do the work either way. And so my own personal thing would be like, let's try the conservative first. And if that doesn't work, I'll know I've done everything I could. And surgery is my last resort and that's fine. And you go ahead and get that and you'll feel good about it knowing that it truly was what you needed. And some women and men do need that. So no shame there at all. Um, so the, uh, so yes, that was basically my last comment about all of that. And I just wanted to reiterate that gymnastics really requires superhuman strength and it requires a superhuman core to match. So as gymnasts, we're not only trying to get back to regular life, we're trying to get back to being fit and also doing skills. It's a big ask and you have to take care of your body if you wanna be in it for the long haul. So it's definitely worth exploring this and giving it your all to make sure that your body is really functioning at its best and that you don't let any lingering issues come back to haunt you in the future. So that was really all I needed to say about that. Again, I know it was a lot. Thank you so much for hanging in there. And if you do have concerns you want to speak with me about in private, you are more than welcome to, dis to schedule a discovery call with me. I have links for that on my website, and you'll be able to see that in the PDF. But to quickly explain, you can go to Home Exercise Coach, so H-O-M-E, E-X-E-R-C-I-S-E coach.com. And there's a tab in the program section that says gymnasts, and you'll be able to go right there. Um, but like I said, the PDF will have it linked as well. You can also just go for it directly and schedule a one-on-one. -on -one if you're like, you know what, I just know I need this. Let's schedule that. That's also perfect. And you can email me with questions too. I have masters at gmail.com for my email. And I'm more than happy to answer questions there. I love connecting with people and I love talking about this stuff. So don't be shy about that. So those are all great ways to reach out if you have questions. Otherwise, I will be doing a circuit workout DR fixing type ab circuit that we'll be announcing shortly. It's probably going to be sometime in August. And I think that'll be really fun. And aside from that, if anybody has questions about DR that I haven't been able to cover, feel free to ask now. Now's your chance.
I'll hang on for a couple more seconds here and see if there's any questions. I've got one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, is there anything, uh, so you've mentioned conditioning exercises to avoid. What about stuff like floor basics? Um, how much of that is like, you should avoid this because my diastasis is not healed yet versus I just have weak core and I need to keep getting stronger. Yes, that's a great question. Were you able to test your DR tonight? Yeah, it's like two fingers around the belly button, but probably a little bit more. Not not too bad. Yeah. Um, three months postpartum. Okay. Yeah. That. So you're kind of on the line. Like I, what I would say to it is, um, it's kind of a hard question because I will tell you like a personal story. When I first came back from my surgery. I thought tramp would be really easy and perfect. And like, I bounced to my back and it was, I had like terrible pain across my abs from doing that. <laughs> it was really bad and I was shocked by it, but now it makes sense. So, I mean, one thing I would just say is like, are there certain moves that you feel like you're compensating in order to do the move, but you don't feel like your abs can handle it? Are there certain skills that feel that way to you? I just can barely still do a backwards roll. <laughs> How about forward rolls? How do those feel? Those are easy though. The first time I did them, um, I definitely realized when you're standing up, it takes a lot more abs than um, I remembered. <laughs> no, and that's exact. That's exactly my experience too. Like certain things, I like literally used to do with no problems, and then I'm like, whoa, this actually feels like a thing now. You know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean. <laughs> So rolls are tricky because I actually consider rolls to be more DR strenuous than even a front or back tuck. Not, well, no, not a back tuck, probably a front. Um, and we have to basically think about it as how much pressure are we creating and for how long. Um, so with a front tuck, you're actually able to like throw your arms and I'm not really going to speak to whether or not you can do front tucks. That's probably like a separate issue. But what I'm trying to say is I would consider rolls to be a little bit more, um, potentially troublesome, but like overall, if you can, for you, what I would try, try to have you do is, are you able to perform a Kegel? Do you, have you worked on that at all? Not consciously or regularly. Okay. Although my postpartum checkup, I was like, Hey, I want to be, you know, evaluated for some for physical therapy. And she's like, just do your Kegels. And I'm like, not what I wanted to hear. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately that happens a lot. And there's like a big issue in PT, right? Well, PT slash doctors right now, where I think a lot of the insurances are like leaning away from giving it. And it's like a whole thing, but, um, I'm going to get too off to topic if I start talking about that. But, um, what you can do is one of the ways to help support your ab muscles and keep them together is to perform a Kegel as part of your crunch work. So, um, if you were to do that, if you were to lift your pelvic floor up during your floor basics, what that does is it helps draw our abs together. Um, and if you have a sec, I wouldn't mind running you through that right now. If you do have a moment to do it on the floor, like we're not going to do rolls, but we'll just do the, the example of the TAs. Sure. Okay, cool. So I'm going to hop on the floor too. So, um, basically what this is, is if we're on our backs, and we're feeling that we have whatever the width is. And then we lie flat again, and then we're gonna draw our pelvic floor up, and then we're gonna come up. Do we feel like that width narrows or does it stay the same? And for most people, it's gonna narrow that DR when they draw the pelvic floor up first. And so that's a great technique if you're doing a skill that's pretty manageable for you that you can focus on that because obviously some skills are harder and it's a lot to think about. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Yeah, it did. So that's, did, did yours get smaller when you did that? Yes. Cool. So that shows you that that's a technique you can use. You can use that during conditioning as well. Um, and if you end up learning correctives, you can use it there too. But overall, what I would say is over time, we want to be testing our DR and we want it to be getting smaller and we want it to be getting to that two fingers or less. And we also want to make sure that our abs aren't so sore that it takes. So I'm okay with a little bit of soreness the next day, but if it's still sore the third day, then I would say you probably overdid it. Okay, thanks. Cool. Was that the answer you were looking for basically? Was that complete? 
yes. And it gives me something to try next week yeah. um, on, on floor basics. Cool. We don't do conditioning, so I'll have to do that on my own. I know a lot of adult classes don't and um, things like cartwheels, like anything that you're not, like your belly isn't opposing gravity is usually pretty safe. Like, so rolls are not as good or safe as handstands and cartwheels, which are going to be safer. Like you obviously want to build yourself back, but the big red flags to look for are you don't want your DR getting bigger with time and you don't want there to be increased pain. If you're not getting that stuff, you're probably on the right track. Did you have any other question? Nope. Um, yeah, I haven't tried kips yet. Um, my first time back in the gym um, with my older son, well, older kid. Anyway, um, yep, totally overcompensated with the quads, like you were saying. Had yeah. zero ab strength, immediately pulled both quad muscles. <laughs> well, so and it's I'll hard because that. there's no, I don't, I feel like there's no clear roadmap for this, um, but I feel like you just like you try stuff and you're like, oh, that's like way too hard. But a lot of it is a little bit of trial and error. Um, but I would always just say like, what comes before that? Maybe doing some glides, you know, working on the leg lift part, like just having that patience because even if our brain remembers how to do the kip, our body is like, yeah, this isn't going to happen tonight. You know what I mean? Um, and everybody makes those mistakes where they overdo it or like make the wrong judgment. And that's part of what I wanted to make sure everybody knows is like, you can't, you can't really like destroy yourself in just one skill. Like it's not, it's not that, you know, scary. It's more about being smart about what you choose to do next time. Yeah. And that's reassuring that I won't make it worse. <laughs> you, you, you'd have to do like 20 kips really. And obviously like you would know by the first or second that it wasn't a good idea. So I think you're going to be all right. Was there anything else you wanted to run by me? Nope. I think I'm good. I really appreciated this. Thank oh you. yeah. Awesome. Um, I appreciate you joining and um, I'm sure there'll be others that will love to hear the recording. So I'll go ahead and end the meeting now and um, hopefully I'll see you again on another call. All right. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.